Hey y'all, the Hebrew Hunter here on the Hillbilly Homestead with another helpful hint. Yeah. And today we're going to learn how to hunt like an Israelite. Mm -hmm. So I had to bring Chris in. He's our number one hunter these days for our family. Right. That is correct. <laughs> I'm doing a different kind of hunting, if you know what I mean. Right. So we appreciate all that he's doing to provide meat for the family. And we wanted to bring him in because a lot of what we're talking about, he's having to apply in the field. So he may have some additional insights. Mm -hmm. Now, you notice at the beginning, I called myself the Hebrew hunter. Um, I've thought about doing hunting videos on my channel, but I really haven't because this is a scripture channel, a Bible channel. And I was afraid that my subscribers would unsubscribe. Yeah. If we start, you know, talking about shooting things. And the channel might turn away from the main focus. The main focus, which is the Word of God. Right. So what we're going to do in this class is we're going to focus in on the Word of God and how it applies to hunting. Mm -hmm. I've gone in and looked at a few other videos trying to find information on hunting, even back when I started trying to keep the law, and I found nothing. Yeah. All, the, all of the videos on YouTube about hunting seem to be deciding whether it's okay to hunt or not. Yeah. Going, people were going through that phase. Yeah. Um, not really the technicalities of it and what we're supposed to be doing. Um, some even question whether we're supposed to eat meat or not. Mm-hmm. So in this class, we're going to concentrate, like I said, on the scripture. We're not going to show you any pictures of deer, at least whole deer. We may show you pictures of portions of them as we get into the nitty gritty of the scripture. Um, we want this to be comprehensive, covering everything as far as the uh, hunt is concerned, just from a Bible base. Right. Now, for the rest of you guys who are used to our channel, you may want to pay attention to this because... Part of the end times plan is that we will really have to rely on these hunters for our food. Right. Um, I think only 4% of the uh, population are hunters now, but we're going to depend on that 4% when it comes, when the Walmart trucks start running. Right. And we can't get meat otherwise. You know, these people are kind of ignored now, but it, eventually they're going to become very important to us as they provide us with our food. Yeah, second to the priests and Levites. Absolutely. And we're going to find here that they actually work hand in hand. They go together. Okay. So if you know anybody that's a hunter or if you're planning on eating meat in the future, you may want to pay close attention to this video. Right. All right. Now, the first thing we want to address is whether or not we are supposed to be hunting at all. Right. And for a scriptural reference, we can come to Genesis chapter 27, which shows that they, in fact, did hunt. And they hunted deer, too. Right, with that same venison. My friend, go ahead and read the whole verse. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out to the field, and take me some venison. Now this is Isaac talking to Esau. Yeah. Um, Esau is known as the hunter, um, and... Isaac was on his deathbed at the time. At the time, right, and he was wanting to give the blessing to his firstborn son, Esau. Right. Now, I'm not sure how all of that worked as far as um, this meat and this blessing or this food and this blessing. Right. But what we're focusing in on here is how... Um, they did hunt. They did hunt. And, and we have other references, too, as far as eating meat is concerned. But another thing I wanted to show you out of this chapter I found interesting is not only does it tell them to hunt, but it actually gives them details on how to hunt. Oh. Um. Yeah. You see right there, he's talking about scent control. Mm. You know, yeah. this, is, this is their scent control back in the day. Go ahead and read verse 27. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the scent of his raiment and blessed him and said, See? The smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. So, this is Esau being an expert hunter knows better than to bring his clothes in the house. Right. He's leaving. That's why they smell like that. And that's why they don't really smell like a human or a man. is because he's keeping his clothes in, I guess, in the field so that they stay smelling like the field and not as a human. Right. So, not only is the Bible telling us that we can eat meat but it's actually telling us how to get this meat and back up in that other verse he even told him to use a bow yeah so we can write this down as far as one of the ways to hunt like an Israelite Did it go with a bow and have your clothes smelling like the field I guess I don't have to tell these guys that they already yeah. know <laughs> anyway let's go on to the next verse 
Now, like I said, I want to cover everything, so I'm going to bring you over here to a book called The Shepherd of Hermes. Okay. This is in the first book, um, Visions, right? And we see down here in verse 97. Matter of fact, go ahead and read that. Now, therefore, hearken unto me, and have peace one with another, and visit one another, and receive one another, and do not enjoy the creatures of God alone. So this is telling us that we have a requirement to share this meat. Right. Right. And like you said, only 4% of the world, or at least America, are hunters. Mm -hmm. Right. But they're actually going to be responsible for our meat in the future. Right. And they have to share it. Say, yeah. do not enjoy the creatures of God alone. So that's important for them to understand. You guys taking down this uh, these deer, um, you might want to consider sharing it. And just as an aside note, me, myself... I try to give away my first deer every year, mm -hmm. and I, and that's actually how I ended up doing this class because I don't think I'm the only one. Right. We have a neighbor who has brought us three deer so far. Mm -hmm. um, I believe he brought us the first one his son killed this year, and then he brought us the one that he killed this year too. Right. And maybe even the one that his daughter-in-law killed. Yeah. yeah. So I know that he's understanding how he's supposed to share this meat. But I was prompted to do this class because I believe that there's something else going on there. The reason why he's bringing it to me. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, I'm kind of making this video for him. Right. Right. Because when I'm thinking about what he's doing, he's, um, he's actually bringing it to a priest. He doesn't even know that. Right. He doesn't know I'm a priest. But even still, he's doing it. Yeah, and he's bringing it here. And I believe the reason why him being such a generous person, the father has turned his eye toward him and has now slated him for potentially making it through this tribulation and going over into the other side. Right. Well, once he gets over to the other side, talking about the kingdom of heaven, he's absolutely going to have to know what we're about to teach here. Right. Else hunting will get him in big, big trouble. Small little things that we don't know that the Bible says about hunting would actually put our own lives in danger we're going to find out here right all right so the main verses that we're going to come in is uh leviticus chapter 17 okay now we're going to go down through here we're going to try to hit the highlights uh pretty quickly um you guys want to study this uh chapter in uh greater detail but like i said we're just going to hit the highlights here covering as much ground as we can as quickly as we can all right if you would chris go ahead and read verse one and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, What did he say? Speak unto Aaron, and unto his sons, and unto all the children of Israel, and say unto them, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, saying. Okay, so now Aaron, we understand he was the priest at the time. Right. Right. And, you know, and his sons would be the Levites. Now, this is important for, like I said, our hunter friend here, because his, his oldest son is actually part of this group that's being talked about in verse 2. Mm -hmm. He is actually a Levi. Um, he doesn't know it either because he hasn't watched many of our videos, but all firstborn males are Levi's, Levi's and they're supposed to start their service at the age of 25. And having done so, they become priests at the age of 50. Right. Yeah, and just as an aside note, you can only become a high priest if your daddy was a priest too. Okay. So I, I don't qualify for that. But so that's like a hereditary position. Yeah, absolutely. You you would have to be born in a house that has been keeping all of the laws. Makes sense to me that you would have to be born in the house of a right. priest to be a high priest, right? But anyway, um, the message here is that all firstborn males. Are Levi's and of the priestly order. Right. That's the way the Father set it up. Every house will have their own. That's what the that's what the scripture means when it says we will be a kingdom of priests. Mm -hmm. Every house will have these Levi's and priests in it who will be responsible for making sure we keep up with the laws and the rules. And we'll be able to serve to perform these ceremonies. Right. All right. Let's look at verse three. What a man soever there be of the house of Israel. That killeth an ox or lamb or goat in the camp, or that killeth it out of the camp. Okay, so now here it is in the house of Israel. What does the house of Israel mean? That's the people that are ki keeping the law. Keeping the law, like we did a class on. We've done many classes on who Israel is. It, it has nothing to do with blood ties or where you're from or where you grow up or where you live or any of that. Nothing physical. It, nothing physical. So... You guys check those other classes before, you know, you dismiss it and say, you know, I'm not Israel. So these rules don't apply. 
Right. If you're planning on seeing the kingdom of heaven, these rules absolutely apply to you. And you need to make sure that you are Israel. You no, know, that would actually be the only people in the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven will be Israel. Right. Right. And so what he's telling them is when you kill any animal, right? Right. A ox, a lamb, a goat in the camp, which means that you raise these animals. Right. Like you would raise sheep. Or it says outside of the camp as if you were hunting. Right. So no matter what animal you kill, this is what you're required to do. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, let's look at verse 4. And bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer an offering before the Lord, before the tabernacle of the Lord. Blood shall be imputed unto that man. He hath shed blood. And that man shall be cut off from among his people. Now we have to get really technical here. Yeah. Because you're wondering where is the tabernacle. Many of these hunters are going to say, hey, I don't know where the tabernacle is. Right. Well, the tabernacle is in you. You are the tabernacle. We're talking spiritual here. And he's simply saying, the way I understand this is when you kill this animal, you are now required to pray over it. Mm -hmm. Right. To And if you guys understand something different, I, I know there's those who want to you know, point to the physical tabernacle. But if you understand something different, you can put it down in the comment section. But the way we do this is when we kill an animal, we immediately pray over when we find it. That's the first thing we do is we pray over the animal. Right. As we bring it to the door of the tabernacle. Asking for forgiveness for shedding this blood. Absolutely. So in a way that is an offering. Yeah. All right. Now, so when it comes to praying, you know, we have to be very particular about how we pray. Right. Um, our father gave us an example of how to pray back up there in Matthew chapter six, uh, verses nine through 13. We hear about the Lord's prayer. Right. But it's important that we keep that prayer in mind because there are certain elements to the prayer, certain markers that we have to hit. Yeah. Right. Where it says, like, for instance, our father. Right. We we're not saying God, we're not saying Lord, we're not say, even saying Jesus. We're saying our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. This is talking about our spiritual father, the father of our spirits. And then we're blessing his name. This is how we start our prayers. Right. So when we're praying over this animal, we have to make sure that we that we're doing that. Right. And and then we proceed with our prayers. We normally would. Mm -hmm. But it's not all spiritual. We're going to see that there are some physical elements to it as well. Right. Some some parts that he requires us to make an offering that we still have to do even today. Right. We're going to see that here and we're going to understand their importance here, too. But notice that it says, if you do not do this, look what it says. The blood of this animal will be imputed unto you. Yeah. So what does imputed mean? Imputed means that it's assigned to you. Yeah. So this blood is in your hands. Yeah. Now it's your responsibility. Yeah. And so this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Right. And then so the hunter is immediate. Don't get don't click off yet. You know, because watch this next verse right here. This one is going to come out of the third testament of the Bible. And some of you guys have never heard of this book here. Um just understand that there are way more books of scripture than the Bible. Right. Right. There's a reason why the number of six, six is there. And six is the number of incompletion. Right. So somebody is trying to tell us that the Bible was incomplete. And the reason why the Bible was incomplete was because there are missing books. They took books out. Yeah. Hidden ones and suppressed ones and. Uh, forgotten ones and lost ones and even ones that apocryphal ones yeah taken yeah even ones that you know only the Pope has down there he won't share with the rest of us there's many more books I promise you there's over 666 books yeah but I understand how our father allowed those books to be missing because we have a hard time reading the 66 what if he dropped 600 books on us and told us we had to read those <laughs> <laughs> anyway um, this one right here is the third testament of the Bible, which is the latest installment. You can uh, find a link to it down in the description of this video, um, both an audio version and a PDF that you can download to your computer. We're going to drop down to chapter 55, which is where we hear about the purification of the world and the judgment. Yeah. It gives us details about you know some of this stuff that's happening and going to happen to us. But we come down to verse 21. There's a very important verse here related to this. Okay. Which is talking about how we're not really being held accountable for our actions these days. Right. It shouldn't be any surprise 
I mean, we could do almost anything we want and nobody's being punished for it. Mm -hmm. We can break the Sabbath day. We can eat. Well, we can do a lot of things and there seems to be no punishment for it. Right. The ground's not going to open up and swallow you and close you back under. Well, that's what happens on Judgment Day. Yeah. Right. And so that's what he's saying here in verse 21 is... It is during the judgment days when we'll get judged based on our actions. Right. Go ahead and read verse 21. Nonetheless, at the hour of judgment, I have never presented myself to ask if you have yet repented, if you have prepared yourselves, or whether you remain still submerged in disobedience and evil. So you remember the days of Noah. When they were leading up to the, the flood, Yeah. Noah was out there building an ark. And like it says down there, he was met with ridicule, mm -hmm. right? But the people who were around him, they wasn't suffering for the actions that they were doing. Right. It's like they were living life to the full. But the judgment came when it started raining. Yeah. Well, that, it kept raining and kept raining. Well, that and then because they wasn't on that ark, they found themselves judged that that was their judgment right. and that's similar to the way it is now and we talk about the ark in you know on our channel um i may have to give you guys a playlist of videos to watch um down in the description of the video especially for the ones who are new to our channel because you want to understand what this ark is mm -hmm. but really quickly let's come back up to verse 17 where it's talking about the ark okay it, it, go ahead and read that verse but i come to protect the people instructed by me and humanity in general to whom I have made myself known in this time. Listen, my children, here is the ark. Enter, I invite you. To get across these floodwaters that we have coming called the apocalypse or the tribulation, we're going to have to have an ark just like Noah. Right. But look at verse 18. For you, O Israel, the ark is the practice of my law. And all who fulfill my commandments in the most perilous and bitter days will find themselves within the ark strong and feeling protected by the mantle of my love so israel for israel is the law right right on this just like we're talking about if you know how to hunt during these days you it's going to be to your benefit mm -hmm. but if you don't it's going to be to your own peril right so it's simply understanding or practicing the law as it says there but then go on and to all this humanity i say again the ark is my law of love and all who practice love and charity with their fellow man and with themselves shall be saved. So this is what's going on with our hunter friend here who's bringing us these deer. Mm -hmm. He is actually getting on the ark by sharing this food with us and other people and other things that he that he's doing. Practicing the law of love. The law of love. He's, he's, he's providing love and see the way this all works in the end times as we go together. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, in, a, in certain situations, you would have the Israel who is practicing the law may not have meat to eat. Right. While you have the rest of humanity practicing love, sharing with these people. Well, they will be on the ark together going across. Right. Right. So it's important to understand this ark. So when we're looking back here at verse four, we don't need to be so worried, but we definitely don't want to ignore this. Right. Because like we say, judgment day is coming. It is coming. You know, I can go out there and shoot a deer right now and nothing's going to happen to me. But you let it be in the tribulation or on the other side of the tribulation. And, you know, me and that deer might be laid out there together. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, this is serious. But then notice this part right here. He says, he has shed blood and that man shall be cut off from among his people. Yeah. So this is a way to get separated from Israel. Basically turning yourself back into a Gentile right. and getting yourself kicked off of the ark. Like I said, this is important stuff. All right, look at verse 5. To the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, even that they may bring them unto the Lord, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priest, and offer them for peace offerings unto the Lord. So like we said, each family is supposed to have this Levi. Right. right. And then many of them will have a priest too. But it is these people that we're bringing these offerings. You know, like we said, a lot of this is prayer. Mm -hmm. But there's also some physical elements here that we're going to see. Like in verse 6. Look at that. And the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. 
and burn the fat for a sweet savor unto the Lord. So this is what's going on. This is why he's bringing these deer here. He don't even know that this is going on. He just drops them off. Not knowing that we are actually performing these acts for him. Right. But like we said, he has a Levi in his own family. Maybe even a priest in his own family. Mm -hmm. And they too need to learn how to do this. Yeah. Because they may not be able to have a truck to come over here. Right. Or he may there. need all of that meat for himself. He might not, you know, he may not be able to share that time. And they may need to eat that meat. Right. Well, if he doesn't go through this, he could actually have this blood imputed upon him. So we're going to get into the details of this particular offering in this video. Okay. But look at verse 7. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils, after whom they have gone a whoring. This shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generation. So he doesn't want us to sell the meat. Right. That's what he, So instead of sacrificing this food unto idols, like some would do, they kill it and, you know, take it down to the butcher shop and then sell the meat. He's saying to prevent this, he wants us to bring it to the priests right. and make this offering. All right. Look at verse eight. And thou shalt say unto them, whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers which sojourn among you that offereth a burnt offering or sacrifice. And bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer it unto the Lord. Even that man shall be cut off from among his people. So he's saying it twice. Yeah. You know, anytime he say the same thing twice, you know, it's serious. Very. Right. And this, you got to understand, we have a spiritual brotherhood here. Um, we did a video not too long ago talking about how our brothers travel at light speed. Mm -hmm. You know, we ha we are under angelic protections these days. And I believe that's what it's saying here. If we do this wrong, we could actually get cut off. And, and lose our protections. Lose our protections. And then we could end up, you know, trying to swim across this water. Right. Outside of the ark. All right, look at verse 10. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. So now we're switching gears again. Yeah. Because it's talking about eating blood. Mm -hmm. Not only have we killed this animal, but then, which, you know, if we didn't do it right, it, it puts us in peril. And now the way we eat it can also harm us. Right. If we're eating with the blood. Right. Now, this is nothing new. Right. When we look back over in Genesis chapter nine and verse three and four, it says that we can eat anything. Yeah. Right. Any, any all living creatures are for our food. But then when you see down in verse four, it says that we're not supposed to eat the blood. Right. You can eat anything that moves, but the blood and the life you may not. And then over here in the book of Jubilees in chapter six, it says pretty much the same thing. Verse six says we can eat anything we want. Mm -hmm. But then look at verse seven. But flesh, with the life thereof, with the blood, ye shall not eat. For the life of all flesh is in the blood, lest your blood of your lives be required. At the hand of every man, at the hand of every beast, will I require the blood of man. So this is serious business here, eating the blood. Right. right? And there's many ways, possible ways, that we can get the blood out. You know, we don't want to get into too many details in here. Probably the easiest, fastest way is just to boil the meat. Yeah. That's what they did back in the day. Um, they had seething pots where they would basically have the meat boiling um, or to remove the blood. And then they would just uh, pull the meat out of that bloody water. Right. And then pour that broth that they called it. They poured it out on the ground. Mm -hmm. Poured it out like water. So... I just want to make sure we understand that this is, is important. Yeah. You know, we can't eat the blood. You know, if if you like rare meat, you might want to change your dietary habits. I mean, yeah. I don't like telling grown man what to do, but this is serious business. Look at verse 8. Next thing he talks about is killing people. Yeah. Right? Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So whether you're a hunter or not, this applies to you. Right. You, you got to get the blood out of the meat. All right, let's go on to verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your soul. No sin can be atoned without blood. Right. And so this is basically saying killing that animal is a sin. 
Yeah. But if we put his blood on the altar, we basically wipe away that sin. This is why it's important to bring it to the priest. So that you can make an atonement. Or important to teach your Levi's in your own house how to do this. And it's not hard. You know, it's actually really, really simple. Right. Um, you basically just need fire. Fire and a little bit of blood. Well, the animal is giving us the blood. Yeah. We just got to get the fire. All right, let's go on to verse 12. Therefore, I said unto the children of Israel, no soul of you shall eat blood. Neither shall any stranger that sojourneth in your land eat blood. So how many times do we got to hear it? I think this is the third time. Well, maybe more. Go on to verse 13. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. Cover it with dust. And that's important, right? Because when you're out there in the field, and this animal has bled out on the ground. Mm -hmm. We can't just leave that blood there. Right. And when we slaughter this animal, we have to, again, cover it with this dust. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that makes sense, especially if you've read the book of Adam and Eve, when you, you know, see how the earth reacts to this blood, you know. Basically spat it back out. Yeah. Refuse so, to take it again. So this, the blood is a big deal. Right. And so we don't just leave it exposed there, you know, just covered up with dirt, which basically just allows it to go ahead and break down. Mm -hmm. But this goes for any animal, not just deer. And it's talking about birds and fowl and everything. We have to dispose of the blood properly. Again, this is why you are putting this in the hands of the priests and the Levites. Right. This is part of their job to keep us clean. If it were not for these scripture and these individuals responsible for uh, the upkeep of these scripture, we would have blood and stuff all over the place. Right. All right. Let's look at verse 14. For it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore, I say unto the children of Israel, ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh. For the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eat of it. Shall be cut off. Shall be cut off. Separated from your people. Right. Go ahead to 15. And every soul that eateth that which died of itself, or that which was torn with beast, whether it be one of your own country, or a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. Then shall he be clean. So if you find an animal, you, you went out there hunting and you couldn't find it, and on the way back you see... An animal, you're like, hey, well, here's another requirement. You can't eat that animal, but you have to wash your clothes. Yeah, or if you've shot the animal, but you don't get to it before the coyotes do. Yeah. Now you have to. You have to wash your clothes. All right. All right, look at verse 16. But if he wash them not, nor bathe his flesh, then he shall bear his iniquity. Yeah, so this is why you come to this channel. Yeah. You know, so you can hear this kind of stuff, you know. The scripture has an opinion on everything from the way you cut your hair to when you wash your feet mm -hmm. and everything in between, right? And it's only a matter of digging this stuff out and finding this. And we praise our Father in heaven for allowing us to bring this information out and share it with the rest of you guys. Right. Now, let's get into this peace offering here. Because remember up here in verse 5 that we're supposed to make a peace offering. Right. Now, what are the particulars of the peace offering? Well, we'll have to go somewhere else to find that. Well, let's look up peace offering. I know this is a lot of information, guys. You might want to watch the video a few times. Um, but here we're going to learn about the peace offering. So we'll come back here to Leviticus chapter 3, where it starts explaining what the peace offering is. Mm -hmm. the, the book of Leviticus is actually a book for the priests. Right. The kings and the priests are asked to read this book once a week, every yeah. week for their whole lives. And if you ever read it, you would understand why there's so many rules and details in here that the priests, the Levites, and the, even the kings would want to know about. Right. Anyway, look at verse 1. And if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it of the herd, whether it be male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. So he's going to start talking to us about the peace offering. And you see in verse 2, it's talking about as if you was raising an animal and you're able to slaughter it yourself. Right. It tells us how to dispatch animals. If you can basically drag it to the altar alive. But you're not going to do that with a deer. Right. You know, it's talking about a sheep. But go ahead and read it anyway. 
And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering, and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons, the priest, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. So here is the job of the firstborn son. Right. All firstborn sons have this responsibility if the family plans on eating meat. Mm-hmm. All right, look at verse 3. And he shall offer the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that covereth the innards, and all the fat that is upon the innards. Okay, so this is getting into the part of the animal that our father requires us to sacrifice. Right. You see back in chapter 17 and verse 6 where it's talking about burn the fat. Right. This is the fat that he's talking about. That visceral fat inside of the animal. Right. It's actually very dangerous. It is. Anybody who suffered from obesity knows that visceral fat is bad for you. It kills you. And so you're thinking that you eating it from the animal, that we are what we eat, so that might not be a good thing. And that's why I believe that our Father required for us to burn it on the altar. So that we can't put wrap our lips around it. Right. This, this, when I first read this back in the 90s, yeah, I, that's what I understood. He was taking away the bad parts mm -hmm. and you know leaving us with the rest of the animal, but the parts that was dangerous for us, like the visceral fat, he was telling us to burn it on the altar. Yeah, because if, if he didn't take the visceral fat, then somebody might use it to fry their uh, meat later. Absolutely going to fry it later because oil is expensive. Yeah. Now, but that should be noted. That's a good point because he doesn't say all the fat. Right. And we've been through this before where we've been adding to the word saying that it was all the fat. And then we was wondering, okay, well, how are we going to cook this meat? Mm -hmm. Well, we very well could have taken the fat from a different place on the animal. And used it to cook the meat. Because the fat that he's requiring us to burn on the altar, it says, is the fat that covers the inwards. Right. And the fat that is upon the innards. Yeah, so you can use the fat from like the back of the deer or any other part. Right. Right. That's, that's, that should be noted. Um, it's just this particular fat that he's asking us to burn. And this stuff burns pretty good. Yeah. You ain't got to worry about it <laughs> sitting there. And, and then go on to verse 4. And the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver, with the kidneys, shall he take away. So, there's something wrong with the kidneys, too. Yeah. I'm not sure what. And I don't really want to find out, because we see here that it is a requirement that we burn these kidneys on the altar, along with this fat. Yeah. And then you see that part where it says, the call or the cow above the liver? Yeah. Let's look that up. Because it took me a long time to figure out what that was. But what it turns out is that it's this lace around the intestines. Mm -hmm. It looks kind of like a net that covers them. Matter of fact, read that. Call fat, known as lace fat or fat netting, is the thin membrane which surrounds the internal organs of some animals, such as cows, sheep, and pigs, also known as the greater omentum. Now, when we look at this, Anybody who has slaughtered an animal will remember this lace fat around the innards. Yeah, of the ones that have cloven toes. Well, yeah, I guess that's I guess that's what they have in common. Um, so this fat right here is actually bad for us. Yeah. And the thing is, he has to tell us this because a lot of people eat this. Yeah, I just said in the article before that some people use it as sausage casing. Yeah, they just wrap stuff in it and you know and and cook in it. I, that's part of the way I found out what it was, was somebody was roasting it with yeah. their meat and stuff. And that's, again, why we have to be told to, to burn it, else we would eat it. Right. And it's potentially bad for us, like the kidneys and the visceral fat. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, let's read verse 5. And Aaron's sons shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. Now, I would love if our hunter friend invited me over to help him build an altar yeah. and teach his son how to do this. We all need to learn how to do this. Right. Right. And I believe that's what's going on here. I believe that's why the father has allowed this man to come into our life is so that he can know this and so that he can understand this and he can start practicing and applying this. Getting prepared for the, the, time to come. the time to come so that this blood is not imputed on him. And, and he can survive. And still have meat to eat and share with others. Right. 
Now, if we've missed anything, you guys please put it down in the comment section. But I believe that's all we had on the subject. Mm-hmm. And we didn't show you any deers or anything. Right. <laughs> well, guys, if you if you have any comments, like I said, put them in the comment section. If you would, go ahead and hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. And if you like this kind of content about scripture and Bible facts and stuff, go ahead and hit that bell notification button because we try to put this stuff out at least once a day. Yeah. According to our Father's will. So make sure you're tuned in. Otherwise, this may never pop up on your feed. Right. And you'll never know that. Your life is in danger. Yeah, because you saw in the other thing it said, the beast of the field will come after you too. Mm, well. It says literal, the hunters will become the hunted. All right, we don't want that to happen. So, Chris, let's give him an example of a prayer. Let's close out with a prayer for the hunters, if you would. Okay. All the hunters of the world out there. Our Father, who art in heaven, blessed be thy name. Lord, we ask you to protect all the hunters that are in the field and that are going out into the field. And we ask you to let them perform the acts that are necessary to protect them from their own hunting skills. We ask you to keep them safe, keep them warm, don't let them get too hot, and ask you to put it on their heart to share the meat, if it be your will. In your son's name, amen. And so be it.